Hi, welcome to our little weekly online uh, service from Christ Church St. James, uh, a congregation on the west side of Toronto in Etobicoke. Um, we hope this might be encouragement for you. There might be some folks who are kind of curious about what Jesus is all about. Um, some folks who may have a kind of a casual understanding or relationship with faith. And there might be some who are who actually are really committed, are convinced um, that all of this is really worth building your life on and living your life for. Wherever you might fall, we're just really grateful that you would spend some time with us. We've been doing a weekly study since a year ago in what's known as the Gospel According to Mark. It's a biography of Jesus. It's um, only 16 chapters, but it's taken us a while to walk through it. And today, we're actually beginning the 15th chapter of that biography. So we welcome you if it's your first time, and we thank you if you've been kind of hanging in there with us for a while. We're just going to pray, and somehow God might use this to speak to us no matter where we're at. All right? So God, I want to thank you for this moment, and I'm always kind of amazed to think that you know exactly what we're all about, and what goes through our hearts and minds, and yet... Your love for us never changes. And even if we find we don't believe in you at times, uh, kind of amazing to appreciate that you still believe in us. So I'd really pray, Lord, somehow, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, you'd help us have ears to hear and hearts to understand and minds that really want to, really want to learn, really want to get a handle on what it's all about. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned that we're in the 15th chapter of this book, so I'm going to read a little bit in a second. But while reading this passage for myself this last week or so, um, the thought came of how the Bible is kind of like a telescope sometimes, maybe even like a microscope sometimes, and certainly like a mirror. A uh, telescope kind of helping us gaze at the big picture, everything that's over and above, um, getting a glimpse of something huge. A microscope helping us examine the small, tough issues of life in detail, um, perhaps appreciating, as it boggles our mind, that God actually cares about the little things in our life as well. And then as a mirror, and this might be the toughest part, um, as we come face to face in seeing ourselves perhaps in ways we hadn't seen them and recognizing some things in our lives that need attention. So when I read this story today, for me, it's like a mirror. And maybe it'll be the same way for you. Here we go. Chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the leading priest and the elders and the teachers of religious law, the entire council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus. They led him away and took him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing Jesus of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? I mean, what about all these charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. It was the governor's custom every year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked. For he realized by now the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, 
the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. And then he turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. I read this well in a park this week in West Toronto, waiting for my car to get repaired. And... Uh, and with a pen in hand, I had just underlined some of the phrases from those verses I just read to you. Phrases that kind of really caught my attention. So here, here's what I mean. It begins with these words. The religious leaders met to discuss their next steps. What's going on? These religious leaders spent time during the night, by the way, feverishly working to get their story straight so they could make a case to Pilate against Jesus. I mean, the truth was, of course, there was no case. They had to make one up. So the Jewish leadership, see, they've been trying to destroy Jesus since early on in his ministry. At least twice, they were prepared to actually stone him. They didn't want to execute Jesus, though, during the Passover and the week-long celebration because Jesus had so many supporters, it could cause a riot. But since now they had him in their custody, it was much better in their mind if he could be executed quickly. So they worked at making sure they had their story straight. And as was the case in our previous study, <clears throat> the word ugly just comes to mind right away. If they can't dig up dirt on Jesus, they'll create some instead. So that was the first thing I underlined. They meant to discuss. The second thing I underlined in verse 1 was the words bound him. Bound him. Now this, this follows this. You know, this. Earlier on we read this. When they first got their hands on Jesus. Some of them began to spit on him. They blindfolded him. They beat him with their fist. Prophesied to us, they jeered. And the crowd slapped him as they took him away. That's already happened. Now they bind him. And I, again, you, you might be with me on this. Just struggling to get your mind around where these people are at. I mean, the one who was all about liberty... The one who was all about freedom. That's the one they're tying up. Remember how Jesus began his ministry? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim this is the year of the Lord's favor. And what really strikes me just with those two little words is this. Before you, before I can sing, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Jesus had to be chained and had to forgo his freedom. I mean, he was the ultimate sacrifice and sacrifices are bound with cords and laid on the altar. So they bound Jesus. But they didn't realize that he was about to be offered up on the cross, the altar, to bring about their freedom. That's the catch. To bring about their freedom. I'm also taken up in verse 2 with Pilate's question and Jesus' response. And Pilate says, so, you're the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds with, you've said it. The reason I'm kind of taken up with this is I ask myself, who was really on trial here? 
You might say right away, Jesus. I don't know. I, it looks to me that Pilate is the one really on trial here. I mean, at first he's trying to avoid facing the scene altogether. We know that. He doesn't want the responsibility. And he knows the weight of his decision. So this scene really brings us back again to the ultimate question, which was mentioned in our previous study. What will you do with Jesus? I was thinking a few years ago in this church building where I'm standing right now, I met with a group of young people one morning and I was, I was invited very kindly to share my own story of when I finally faced that question for myself, what will you do with Jesus? And the teens were kindly attentive. Um, some seemed to really understand, perhaps based on their own experience. But there was one young girl who was really troubled. And I have great respect for her because she had the courage to express in front of all of her peers her struggle. I mean, she shared, and I believe it, she shared that she was sincerely interested in Jesus and everything he was about. But she also shared that she really enjoyed life on her own terms. And she really enjoyed fitting in with the crowd and doing whatever they did and going wherever they go. And so her struggle was visible. And finally, she just got it out. She said, Bruce, can't I just choose not to choose? Can't I choose not to choose? In other words, can't I, can't I just be casual about this as long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of my life too much? Can't I have, I'm putting words in her mouth now, can't I have an arm's length relationship with Jesus? Can't I have a don't call me, I'll call you kind of deal? My heart went out to her because she represents so many people of all kinds of ages. A hymn writer from many years ago phrased it this way. He said, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? So do you, do you know anybody like that? Can you relate to that young girl? I mean, is there a bit of a struggle at times? A yes, but not yet maybe approach? If you think about it, does that work in any other real relationship in your life? Being an occasional friend? Um, depending on the options and the opportunities of the moment? And if so, how might that make your friend feel? How would that make you feel if someone treated you, who called you a loyal friend? Why would any of us even consider treating Jesus that way? So before I go a step further, as I was reading this in the park, I just want to ask what you might already be thinking. What will you do with Jesus? I mean, where is Jesus in your life right now? Where would you like him to be in your life right now? And what are you going to do about it? I mean, the bottom line, this is why it's called a personal relationship, because nobody can answer that question for us. We need to answer it, though, one way or another. As one person put it, not to decide for Jesus is to decide not to. So that's where Pilate is when he asks Jesus this question. And Jesus responds with, well, you've said it. And that might sound like a kind of a strange response. It, it may look like it's not a yes, it's not a no. But as you compare biographies of Jesus, like in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus' response was not evasive at all. I mean, he answered there, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight and, and, uh, be, and prevent me from being handed over. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's as if Jesus is saying, Pilate, you know very well the motivation of my accusers. It's political. They're, they're, they're saying I'm a political threat. I'm a revolutionary. I am a king, yes, but of a much different kingdom. One that's actually marked by righteousness and marked by peace and marked by joy. So the leading priest we read 
Keep on accusing him of many crimes. That's what I underline next. They keep on accusing him. Now, we aren't told in Mark what they said, but we're told in Luke what they said. We found this man subverting our nation, they say. He opposes payments to taxes to Caesar, and he says he is a king. I mean, they're making stuff up. Subverting our nation, opposing taxes. He never did that. He never said that. And Pilate could see through it all. So, he still asked the question to Jesus. Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges? And much to Pilate's surprise, Jesus just lets these charges slide. And again, just stop for a second. Can you relate to that experience? Any time in your own life when crazy and unkind and allegations came flying at you, be it from family or be it from friends or maybe people at work. Any wild words said about you, any muddy lies said about you, thrown at you to try to marginalize you, silence you, bring you shame, make you look like an idiot, hurt you, perhaps just because of your faith. Yet how does Jesus respond? Well, how are we meant to respond? We're told, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. We're told, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. As far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. We're told, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And we're told by Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and those who despitefully use you. Wow. Follow Jesus' example. Then we read about this interesting thing I underlined, the governor's custom in verse 6. Governor's custom to release a, pr a political prisoner or prisoner at the Passover time. Um, this was a great feast. And there were Jewish people there from all over the Roman Empire. A real celebration. So to release a political prisoner was kind of a good faith thing. Building a bridge of sorts. Uh, a gift from the powers that be. And in this instance, to make the offer to release a prisoner, Pilate was hoping this might get him off the hook. And they would say, release Jesus, and that would be fine. But instead, we read of another guy who's been locked up for a while, uh, whose name is Barabbas. And we learn some interesting things about this Barabbas, aside from his name, which can be translated, depending on what you read, son of the father. Interesting. Um, we learn that he actually was a revolutionary. No secret about that. He was political. And unlike Jesus, he did take life. He didn't give life. And so when Pilate says, who do you want me to release? What a surprise perhaps to Pilate. I don't know. When they yell about releasing Barabbas. Now it's also interesting in verse 9, the reason Pilate asked them, who do you want me to release? He, we read that he realized the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. He, he knew their hearts the same way, you know, some things are obvious. Envy is a horrible thing. Pilate could see through it. He was hoping they could, he was hoping everybody could see through it. So, what happens then? This is the part that really grabbed me as well. Verse 11, when he says, who do you want me to release? Before they could answer, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand they release Barabbas instead of Jesus. This is, again, the ugliness the power of corrupt leadership, the loudest voice wins, of pressurizing people to do something and say something they had no intention perhaps of saying, and for people to allow themselves to get caught up in the moment and just to go along with it all, fitting in. I mean, it's quite a thing to be able to hold your ground, right, when it's shaken all around you. I mean, the normal thing at least for many people, is just to blend in, not to make any waves, to go with the flow, to go with the crowd, to
to get caught up in the wave of popular opinion, even if we don't know where it's going. That's why I scribbled in the back of my Bible these words years ago. You might have heard them already. A lie doesn't become truth. A wrong doesn't become right. An evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by the majority. This is a crucial part of being a follower of Jesus. It may well mean at times being made to feel a tad uncomfortable and uh, like you just don't fit. Out of touch, out of date, odd or worse. Again, following Jesus is not a popularity contest. Following Jesus is not about a comfy pillow, though there's a different kind of comfort. Following Jesus is not a pleasant pastime. Following Jesus is a passionate quest. And it's being willing to risk being misunderstood, even with friends and family, as you stand humbly but faithfully in the truth as revealed in Scripture. Even if it feels at times you're standing all by yourself. I mean, the big deal here is these religious authorities, they use their power, they use their position to stir the crowd, to demand the release, not of Jesus, but of Barabbas. Wild stuff. And so, verse 12, Pilate asked, then what should I do with this man? You call Jesus of the king of the Jews. And there's the ultimate question again. What should I do with Jesus? And the crowd just yells back, crucify him. And Pilate asks them, why, what charge is he guilty of? They don't answer that question. They can't answer that question because there is no answer to that. He's done nothing. So instead of answering the question, they're pausing and saying, well, hold it a second. They just yell even louder, crucify him. Don't confuse me with the facts. Crucify him. I don't want to hear the truth. Crucify him. Get him out of the way. And in so doing, by choosing Barabbas, they're opting for war over peace. They're opting for hate over love. They're opting for lies over truth. And alternatively, when you and I say yes to Jesus, we say yes to peace. We say yes to love. We say yes to truth. Because Jesus is all about peace. He's all about love. And he's all about truth. The last little verse. This is what I underlined again in my Bible. So I'm sitting on that bench in the park. To pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas. Now, this is when you'd love to see a leader with some guts get up on a platform with integrity and with courage, stand up in all the craziness and all the noise and mayhem and do what's right and do what's true. I mean, imagine if we read here in Mark chapter 15, to do what was right, no matter how unpopular it would make him or how precarious it would put him in his position as Roman governor, Pilate released Jesus. Now that would have been quite a story. I mean, a real victory for humanity. I mean, he would have gone down, Pilate would have gone down in history as a man who stood his ground in the face of incredible opposition. And his example would have inspired countless people throughout generations to be equally as courageous. Because others have taken such a stand for Jesus. Others did take early on a stand for Jesus. You might know the story in John chapter 7 of Nicodemus who actually stood up for Jesus in the presence of his peers. You might know the story of Gamaliel in Acts chapter 7, who actually spoke common sense into a crazy mob. So it's been done, and it's been done many times since. Perhaps you've done it. I bet many of you listening right now have done it. I bet you have. I bet you've stood up for what is right and true. You've taken, a, you've taken that step, a risk. But in this case, Pilate, instead of courage, 
he lacked it to pacify the crowds. Yike. I mean, he caved. John writes, Pilate turned Jesus over to be crucified. Luke writes, he turned Jesus over to the crowds to do as they wished. Matthew writes, he washed his hands before the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is on you. In a total disregard of truth and justice, he desires the approval of the crowd. He desires the security of his position over integrity, over honesty, over the concerns of his own wife, you might remember, and over his own conscience. How does he look in the mirror? And so the, we read at the end, he orders Jesus, and this, he orders Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip and turns him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. And so it begins. After all the mental and physical cruelty, Jesus will be led outside the city. He'll be nailed to a cross. And he will die for the sins of the very people who were crucifying him. I mentioned that we began this little study that the Bible is like a mirror sometimes, showing us things about ourselves you might not want to see. Anything come to your mind? Can you relate to finding reasons to avoid Jesus, to discount Jesus, to, in a sense, bind him and lead him away from your life? Ever wrestle with indecision of hoping to find an alternative to being faithful to Christ or taking a stand for what you know is right? And how do you respond when people might mock you or curse you or lie about you, spread rumors about you or despitefully use you? Can you relate to being more concerned about what others think and your own security than what you know is true? You might see something else in this. Something that needs to be faced and accepted, dealt with. A friend of mine told me years ago, he said, uh, face sin, forsake sin, welcome forgiveness from sin, forget the sin, and forge ahead as someone who is free from that sin. I mentioned that old hymn, What Will You Do With Jesus? Here's how it ends. Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? Will you evade him as, as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him whate'er betide? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? And the closing prayer, Jesus, I give you my heart today. Jesus, I'll follow you all the way, gladly obeying you. Will you say, this I will do with Jesus? A little song from my, my personal experience. Um. How could you say you love me? When everything I do is wrong Why would you waste your time above me When seeing the reasons take so long I used to laugh and joke about you Yet you stayed right by my hand Still believing that I would Understand How could I ever say I love you When all my life I've said I won't How could I show just how I want you When times have shown that I don't how could I expect you to believe me When I have mocked your very word Please allow that now your voice be heard I would tempt your tears to see how many Many times you'd cry 
believe that you weren't there. I tell myself you'd gone, you died, you'd left me. But the times they didn't change, no matter how many, many things I tried. And I can't explain, but I feel you're standing by my side. Please tell me how, Lord. Please tell me why. Please let me know, God, just why I'm alive. Don't let me go wandering Where I've been before Let me hear you knocking On my door Let me hear you knocking On my door I might speak to somebody today. We just pray. Father, I want to thank you for these moments together. I want to pray that uh, you'll help us take an honest look in this mirror, no matter how difficult it might be. I want to pray that we might actually open ourselves wide to your love and welcome you into our lives, Jesus, as our friend and as our Savior. And if it means starting all over, then to help us start all over. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Till next time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.